Um, Devin Underwood. I'm the founder and principal of the Talent Store. The Talent Store is a executive search, recruiting, and um, talent strategy consulting firm. We mainly work with companies in Arizona with a couple that are national. Um, and then also I am the subject matter expert for team and board development here at UACI. So I do have time available and some office hours. I hold sacred every week for you guys. Feel free to go on bookings and uh, grab a time. I'm going to fly through the presentation. This is just a really broad overview of sort of how I see talent strategy um, that I hope helps plant some seeds for you guys, but everybody's going to be in a different place with where this is. The idea is, is most of you are not actively hiring at least permanent staff right now, but you can start to get a concept of how to head that direction in a, in a more impactful and effective way, hopefully. So I'll go through it very quick. It's going to be broad brush, and then you can put time on my calendar to really dive into any details that are more customized to where you're at. Okay, so sharing my screen, I guess. Um, let's hope I pick the right one. So can you guys see the slideshow? Yes, you are. In, uh, it's not in presentation mode, so we see the whole thing. Okay, let me get that. There we go. Perfect. All right, so um, I'll, I'll kind of go, go pretty fast. Um, I'm used to a little more dialogue and discussion, so bear with me. I'm not used to spouting off or listening to my own voice for this long, but um, you know, one of the key pieces of the puzzle is I think the organizations that you see stand out as an employer brand, they look at recruiting, onboarding, career path development as a holistic talent strategy. Um, any of those places that stand out as all of those places people want to work, get excited about working, are passionate and dedicated to stay there. This is sort of how they look at it much more holistically. It's not just an HR piece of the puzzle. It's not just put an ad up, as I say, post and pray, and then see who you get interested, right? So um, we'll kind of walk through what that looks like. In my opinion, um, as you're a larger organization or kind of getting ready to scale, I believe talent strategy sits in its own space. Um, many organizations start with it as an HR function. There's definitely a piece of the puzzle that HR serves in terms of compliance, process management, providing compensation analytics, um, benefits administration, onboarding documentation, so that's a part of it, but really it should be led by operations. Operations, what needs to be achieved and what the growth plans and vision are should be what is leading the talent strategy. And then with HR contributing and then marketing contributing to, depending on how large of an organization you are, your employer brand, advertising, outreach, and then um, even events, uh, depending on what kind of hiring you're doing. So that's just a quick overview of as organizations scale where talent strategy sits in some of the larger orgs. Um, so here we are, talent, T-A-L-E-N-T. -E uh, so you start with your talent avatar. You then complain, you strategize and do your advertising and outreach, lay out the vetting process, execute on all of your vision, narrow and negotiate, that's selecting and closing an offer, and then transitioning, onboarding the person. So we'll walk through each of these pieces. Um, just a quick note uh, from Warren Spossity from GE, you know, how important hiring and developing people is. It really is the differentiator. The companies that have great people and develop them and grow them really stand out. Um, before we jump into the details of the letters, I want to just do a quick set of terminology. Um, as I'm talking to people, I'm learning they have different ideas of what each piece of the puzzle is that you may be bringing on board to your organization. So many of you are, you know, very new, and so you're thinking about an advisory board. Um, an advisory board is just subject matter experts that provide 
um, the leadership team some guidance. They hold no authority. They have no legal fiduciary duty. They do not vote on corporate matters. So kind of a, a you know, a, a group of subject matter experts, similar to what you have at UACI probably, there are, depending on your um, industry and what you're looking for, different ways to go about networking and getting other people interested to be on your advisory board. You may need introductions into certain areas. You may want certain specialties to sit there. Let's say that you're um, a pharmacy company. You want you know, a pharmacist on your board, potentially, as you determine how you're going to set yourself up. So. There's a couple links here, and I don't know if Anita will be able to share these slides of a couple articles I really like about advisory boards. I think those are important for probably where you're all at with your companies, so you can take a look at those. From there, it's the board of directors. So an advisory board is really episodic, meaning it comes on board for an episode, a project, a shift, a pivot, or a startup. It is not ongoing, whereas a board of directors is permanent. They have fiduciary responsibility, they have specific duties, and they influence corporate governance. So board of directors is quite different. Often these two get interchanged, so I just wanted to highlight those differences. Um, I'm guessing most of you are not at a position to need a board of directors, but as you get more engaged advisory members, that's an offer or a path you can make to them if you grow as a company. So something to keep in mind. Um, the next thing on the list is an independent contractor. So this is somebody who is W-9 tax status. They're generally temporary. Um, there are some rules in order to define somebody as an independent contractor. Um, they're not you know, as clear cut as maybe everybody would like, but generally speaking, they have to have a degree of control over their work. They have to have a contract that defines a scope and timeline that they're part of the organization or contributing. And um, they usually have their own business entity that they run their own taxes through. Um, if it's in their own business entity, that's a really clear way to show the Department of Labor that this is indeed an independent contractor. We saw, you know, a few years, well, probably 10 years back, um, the federal government getting much more strict or interested in auditing true contractor status. So something to keep in mind if anybody has questions on whether they're treating someone like a contractor, but their work doesn't really fit that definition, we can always talk about it. And then the next piece of the puzzle is an employee. So you're ready to hire and bring someone on board. This is a W-4 tax status, they're payroll through your company. Once this happens, you're now subject to Fair Labor and Standards Act. So the FSLA defines how you treat an employee based on whether they're salaried, hourly, full-time, part-time, seasonal, temporary, all of these considerations are part of determining how someone operates within your company. There's different thresholds and rules to say who's what, and we can go through those. Mostly it's if you're calling someone full-time and salaried, um, you've got to meet some standards of how they work with you to not track hours or pay overtime. Um, and again, just book time, we can talk about it if you think you're in the gray on anything. Um, I also want to talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a really hot topic right now. Um, oftentimes when I'm going through presentations, I get asked, where does that fit in? It, it is the lens you see every piece of this through. So you're not going to see on here a check mark that I say, and now you consider DEI. Um, it really is a lens you apply to every piece of your recruitment and onboarding puzzle. Um, whether that's looking at compensation and equity, whether that's looking at how you're talking about the job and where you're outreaching to make sure you're being inclusive, um, and how do you welcome or think about diverse perspective when you're creating the job description. So I, I put that out there at the front end um, because it's just, you know, on everybody's mind right now and really important. So little quote from Salesforce, again, another incredible employer brand that um, puts this, this idea of acquiring the right talent in order to grow at the front end of their strategy. Um, and if you guys have questions, Anita, I'm hoping maybe you can mind the chat because I'm terrible at doing two things at once, but um, you can always throw questions in the chat if I'm going through something too quickly. 
Yes, absolutely. Please use the chat function and we will go into those then. Great. Okay, so when you're first starting out, we're going to create a talent avatar. This is probably the piece of the puzzle that um, companies skip more often than not. And I think the most impactful place to spend your time. So you're determining who you need, skills, experience, key duties, areas of responsibility, soft skills, motivators, passion fits. Who's this person that's really going to make an impact in where you need to head? You define the compensation. So doing the market research, looking at equity, what are other people in your organization already paid for similar roles? And take a look at your budget and walk out what that means to your budget and, and uh, how much runway you have for that person. And then, then from there, when you really know who, where do they even live in the marketplace? Um, are you open to remote? Um, are there competitors? Are there similar industries that have the same types of people? So really deciding, okay, where is this person even in the world and how do I get their attention? Um, so some core needs to think about, what do they need to accomplish? What are their daily duties, education needs? Um, how do you measure their experience to the success you need them to create? Or, or is, there, is there some proven experience there? Um, some jobs you may need to have some physical requirements, environmental considerations. Do they need to travel? Who do they report to? Are they going to be full-time, part-time, hourly, salaried? Um, on the soft skill side, you know, start with what's the biggest pain point that they need to solve? What do you need them for, right? What are their motivators or passion fit? What is somebody going to be excited about or connected to about what you guys are doing? How are you gonna measure their progress in the first year, 90 days, six months, year? Is there a career path here? So when you're talking about the benefits and why someone would come on board, one of the carrots you can hang is, this person is gonna start as a director, but as we grow, we'll be a C-suite potentially. So you can talk about how, that, how that's going to evolve in your organization. If it's a leadership role, what is that leadership style that's going to be best fit for, for you and the team? And then any other team dynamics that need to be considered. You know, do you have really great ideators and visionaries, but you don't have an implementer? And so you need somebody who can really process and systemize what needs to get done. Um, one of the things we do with clients at the talent store is when we're getting a new role, we don't just take a job rec or a job description and say, okay, thanks, we'll go at it. We walk them through this and really start to understand who they need. So we're not just throwing paper resumes, but we're really taking pulse and making some matches. Any questions on this and I'll go forward otherwise. Um, okay, so now that you know who you need, um, uh, you need to, oh, and I, this is one of my favorite quotes, but the first secret to getting what you want is knowing what you want, right? <laughs> so that's why that talent avatar is so important. Um, so and then that in, we have a question. Uh -huh. um, so if you're a scientist entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, and you're, you know, like, for example, me, like, I don't know really anything about business, I'm learning about it, but what would you say is like the first and foremost skill set that you need to go out and acquire for the business? It depends on your business. So um, we need to find out kind of what you, what stepping stone you need to accomplish first. So we could talk about um, if you're looking at like business operations, if that's what you mean, business management and operations manager, like a COO type co-founder. Um, that could be a path if you're needing revenue generation pretty much out the gate or a network connection. We can talk business development. So it depends. Gotcha. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share the, uh, the uh, note from Solomon. Uh, it's been all about payroll taxes for him. So I know that's, uh, that's sometimes a big thing. Meaning trying to avoid them or that's a big expense. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, but yeah, we can always talk about that, Solomon. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's part of bringing someone on board full time. Right. And so, you know, I had a, a discussion with the software development. They're really still creating their prototype. And so my pushback was, do you need somebody on board or can you bring someone on for the project? Someone who's expert who already knows how to build freelance and you can bring them on for three to four months to kind of get the prototype down the road um, before becoming an employer which is a whole new set of payroll taxes and other considerations. Uh, Devin, just to add on on that and, and the SBIR program, mm -hmm. uh, your key people usually should be employed by your company, not subcontracted out. So I've had this discussion with several of the companies that we've talked to and, and it's an issue with a lot of the startups mm -hmm. because they don't know who they need and they are starting up, sometimes it's starting up with one or two people. And when you submit a proposal, one or two people will not hold the company structure together and either investors or even the reviewers who are making decisions for the government on how to spend our tax money, they're not gonna go, in, usually they will not invest or mm -hmm. put money into a one person company. So it's very important to define who are your key people, the skill set, so that you could actually um, show that you have the team complete that could successfully implement the scope of the work that you're proposing, but also that will have the skill sets and the ability to keep the company uh, growing and, and not going under, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and there's ways to, and Sonia, I don't know what the SBIR thinks about fractional, um, so especially particularly on this, the financial and accounting side, some people will bring a fractional uh, yeah, those team are, until they need those, a full time. Yeah, those are not an issue because usually mm -hmm. a fractional like uh, uh, accounting um, or um, administrative jobs, they're mm -hmm. all part of uh, overhead. And, uh, and so you have to factor in in the overhead when they're doing their financial projections and budget in as admin. Um, but people that will actually help execute direct labor uh, related to the job, those uh, are preferred to be uh, W-2 employees as opposed to 1099s because mm -hmm. it defeats the purpose of the SBIR if you're growing other companies then, or subcontractors, then why don't they apply instead of you? If you mm -hmm. apply, you're supposed to be the subject matter expert on that field and we're bringing in innovation with state of the art in all the aspects of uh, what your defined approach is. Mm -hmm. So if y'all are going out for funding uh, federally, I think it's really great to then talk to Sonia and get an idea of what should be reflected in, ter in terms of expertise internally of your team and then put some time with me and we can figure out how to get those people to you. Yeah, and that's kind of what's going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So um, now that you know who you need, you need to get out there. Let's get their eyes on this job and get them excited about the role and excited about who you are. And, and by out there, I mean really reflect what you need so that you're attracting the right person. Um, so, considerations, where, where are you going to advertise and network, and then what is your messaging? Not just what the ad is, but what is your outreach messaging on LinkedIn, in your networks, through UACI, through all the people you know? How do you get a message to your advisory board so they're networking on your behalf, so that you get this right person and you get as many options as possible for the fit? So, considerations, putting out front, mission, vision, values. If that's a core part of who you guys are and what you think will attract the right fit, put it out there. Um, culture, passion fit. So if you're in green tech, um, Solomon, I have a client who's out of Germany that does like the components for off-grid solar. And so, you know, I always, when I'm bringing on some of their leadership team, because they're creating, they're bringing their leadership to the Americas, um, it is all about that passion connection to green tech and what it can do and what you can impact for off grid. Right. So put that out in the front end. Um, what's the physical environment you need to really talk about and put out there as a time saver or as an attraction mechanism. 
know your top three selling points for your company. You guys know the top three selling points for your services or product, but why would someone want to work with you? Why would someone want to be a part of this rocket ship that's heading to wherever it's headed, right? Um, what are some company or industry targets or mismatches? You know, I work with a med device consulting firm and they know if we're going after regulatory people, don't go pharma because they're just going, it's just not going to be the same path and they're going to confuse it and make it more complicated. So where, where do you need to hone in? The major job boards, you always have Indeed, ZipRecruiter, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, um, et cetera, et cetera. Google has job postings now. Um, what are some other specialty networks? If I'm looking for an architect, I'm advertising on AIA. Um, so, you know, am I on Facebook in developer spaces, messaging to get some software developers? Different things to think about. And then how do you get all of that out there? We'll talk about, but those are all those pieces of the puzzle. And then of course, personal networks, um, cohorts, your advisory board, and direct recruiting, going after people and saying, would you ever consider this? Um, it's a big, big piece of the puzzle and it's a big lift. And so that's why a lot of people use somebody like me and my company is to do all of that work for you, bring it all together and get you the top candidates. But um, all pieces of that puzzle to think about. And then, so you've got your average, you know who you need, you've got your advertising posted, and now it's time to, while that, that's working and you're out there messaging and networking, figure out when I do have people, how am I gonna determine this is the right person? So laying out your vetting process, and I call it a vetting process and not an interview process. It's not just interview questions that you're considering. You also wanna think about what are the modalities? What are the ways I'm going to meet these people that are gonna show me best who they are? Are there skills tests I need to apply? Are there personality uh, tests that we're interested in or assessment? What should I be thinking about here, right? And then who should be interviewing? Who should be a part of this process? Who should be bought into this hire? So you may decide that there's an initial interview with you as the founder and CEO, and then a panel interview with some of your advisory board or a panel interview with their peers, um, depending. If this is a sales or business development role, pre-COVID and they're entertaining clients, take them to lunch, see how they eat in front of people. How do they act at a restaurant? Um, you know, all of these things that you need to understand about the person before bringing them on board. Um, so depending on the role, I like to get really creative. Um, even with a customer service company, you know, if I'm talking about a restaurant or um, when I was helping Mr. Carwash, it was like, why are we interviewing in an office? This will never be their life. Get them out there on the floor. Walk really fast and see if they keep up with you. Are they just in the way and customers can't go around them? So there's all kinds of ways to assess and vet who the right person is, just depending on what you're looking for. Um, and I like this quote, find ball players, not people who look good in baseball caps. So you've gotta be able to see how they play ball, not just how they present in an office setting one time. So now you've figured out who you need, you've got your ads working, you're doing your networking, and um, you know what you're gonna ask or how you're gonna get to know the person. You, this is all execution. And so attracting and engaging, interview and assessing, and then you're heading toward hopefully offer and onboarding. And there are pieces of this puzzle that we usually talk about more at the front end um, but there's tech stack considerations there. So applicant tracking systems, you guys don't need to get in the weeds on that, um, but someone like me, I help build that infrastructure out for certain companies that wanna do it all internally rather than outsource it. Um, that's a way to get all of your advertising out, catch everything in one place, do some pre-screening, have some communications management there. There's also process management. Who's going to manage the process of this? Usually that sits in HR, it can also mean that you're selecting a recruiting partner like the talent store. So, um, you know, what do you need to know about that partner? What do they need to know about you? Some recruiting firms are set up specialized. So if you really just need to pipeline software developers, maybe you just wanna to go to a firm that works with developers. 
But if you need to have a partner that's going to grow your company holistically and really help you, you can trust and make some matches and understand your culture deeply. You want to look for a recruiter who's not specialized. Um, you know, there's firms that do like accounting and finance and IT. Um, you have to tell your story over and over again, and it can feel really transactional. So how do you find somebody that just knows who you are and can then be ahead of the game and strategizing and pipelining who you need along the way? And then how are you going to communicate with candidates? How are you going to get back to people? How are you going to keep everything straight and organized? Some of that's tech stack consideration. Some of that's messaging. So if you're a customer service company or in an industry where you're also recruiting from, but you service, that brand impression happens um, to how you treat the candidate or how you message or communicate with the candidate. So really important to keep that in mind. And those are all pieces of execution that give somebody an edge or make people stand out if they're really strategic and smart about it. And it can also find you a ton of efficiencies. So um, Howard Schultz from Starbucks, hiring's an art, not a science. Um, resumes can't tell you whether someone will fit into your company's culture. And so, you know, what does the execution of your recruitment process say about who you are as a company? Um, it's amazing. I've been in um, really innovative companies whose recruiting process is so clunky and strange and not at all reflective of who they are on the product side. And so how do we bring that together so there's not a disconnect? And so candidates, you know, if you're innovative, candidates feel you're innovative and they're talking about it. Okay, so you've executed, you've vetted, and now you've got your top candidates, hopefully. And some of those pieces of the narrowing puzzle are, you know, as you're going through the interview process, who, you know, debrief the hiring manager with each interview, really understand where they're waiting, pros and cons, who's edging out somebody else, understand the waiting criteria, um, consider chemistry, who's just, you know, really uh, connecting with the mission vision. I do want to make a caveat here about culture fit. So, um, and I just did the, the thing that I don't like, but, you know, people say I want them to fit into our culture. I like to change it to culture need. So not I, you know, they sound like me, they look like me, I want to have a beer with them is not a culture fit consideration because then you end up creating a company that's a bunch of you. And you've got some diversity issues in perspective and communication style and all kinds of things. What you want is culture need considerations, meaning how do I balance my teams? How do I get communication balanced or style balanced or bring in a new perspective that's really going to make us um, even better? And so those are things, but chemistry can't be left out of that. You've got to have a team chemistry and some chemistry with leadership that really carries you beyond and gets you enjoying working together. So that's a consideration. Um, when you're talking about closing on salary. So one, of, I think the service we offer that clients like the most is that we handle all of the salary for them. This seems to be everybody's least favorite part of the puzzle, candidate, client, but you know, for us at, at the talent store, we're talking about salary from the very first conversation and really understanding where is this person, what do they need, and then checking in on it every time we learn a little more about the job so that we don't have people falling in love with each other and it just breaks down over that at the end. That's the worst feeling. So we try to handle that on the back end. Um, if I'm helping you guys, figure that out. I can help walk you through how to do that. Um, one of the biggest pieces of the salary puzzle, if you're talking about equity of pay, do not ask what they now make. Um, in fact, some states are outlining that question, but what it does is it memorializes lower pay for people who are um, potentially, you know, mostly women and minorities is who this impacts. But you want to ask, now that you know a little bit more about the job, what would your budget be for this kind of role? What would you be willing to come in at? Particularly at a startup, you know, our budget is tight, but we understand you have to pay bills. Where's your threshold? Where's your threshold of base versus what can we incentivize? <coughs> Excuse me. What's your interest in, 
in equity, if that's something you're handed out. Um, we can talk about handing out equity. I have my own philosophies and opinions about that. We don't need to dive into it here. Um, I would save that for really important, you know, leadership co-founding roles. But, um, you know, all of that alignment is important to keep in mind early and often throughout the process. And then developing an offer letter. When you're extending an offer, I always tell my clients and candidates, let's not play this game of you start high, you start low. Let's just go best foot forward. Let's act equitably. Let's really be smart about what your budget is and let's put it out there. I always encourage people to not just highlight what salary is, but to actually give monetary values to the benefits and perks that you're offering um, and really highlight what that means in terms of your investment in that person. And then if you can't get somebody right away, if you can't get them the salary they need, is there places where you can outline in the letter some stepping stones of growth? So with this milestone, we can have another salary review. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, a Jonathan Swift quote, a wise person should have money in their head, but not in their hearts. So keep it at the forefront, get it out of the way and on the table, and then you can connect on all the other things as you interview and make sure everything else is a fit. Okay, and then we talk transition. So the person's accepted the offer, you guys are excited to work together. And so this is where you've got onboarding and HR doc considerations. Um, getting them integrated into the team, and then uh, so like orientation, all of those pieces, training, what do they need to be trained on for their role, and then really out of the gate, setting some goals and your cadence or accountability check-ins that you're going to have with them. Um, really general rule of thumb, so you want to have your, your pre-boarding checklist, what are all the things I need to get ready for this person, so on day one, they can log into the software they need, they have the accesses they need, they can get in the building and their desk is set up or equipment or whatever. Um, or remotely, they have access to get in um, and connect with us. Day one, day one's like having somebody over to your house for a dinner party. Make sure they know where the water is, make sure they understand where the restrooms are, introduce them to a couple people that they can connect with. Um, kind of host the party so that they're able to settle in and get what they need. Where do they put their lunch? Where do they go uh, eat? I know this is all pre-COVID uh, dialogue. I know a lot of you are going to have remote teams, but there's also remote considerations too. And then week one, what do you want to make sure they understand about how your company functions and communicates so they can get on with their job? And then in the first 30 days, um, you know, this is really, really broad brush and we can narrow down milestones or achievements for the specific role. But, you know, in the first 30 days, they should have gotten another team, understand the space, know all the tools available, know your product and any fundamental procedures that they need to do their job. In 60 days, they're learning as they work. They've got their full responsibilities under their belt by then. They are tracking their achievements or metrics or reporting, however you determine is needed. They're working and collaborating with other teams, so not just within their team, and they're getting used to creating a routine around this role and, and within your company. And in 90 days, they, they're, they're launched. They're doing their job independently. They're um, you know, starting to implement some best practices and becoming a fully vetted member of the team. And I'm gonna drink a little water. So that's part of the considerations with transitioning someone in. So that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to get done. Um, and it sounds like um, a lot of work. I think it does not make the process longer. In fact, it probably makes it a little um, faster and more efficient because you know You've taken the, the thought time to create the strategies that are going to make you make decisions more easily. But it's a big lift, especially if you're doing your day job, especially if you're a scientist who's busy getting the company going. And so, you know, there's different ways to get it done. There's some companies where we help build the internal structure for them. So we help them figure out who their talent acquisition team is. We get them trained. We implement the tech stack and technology. 
get them all set on posting places. We manage their employer brand. Um, and then most of our clients decide, we don't want to invest in that infrastructure. Let's just outsource it to you. And so we become their recruiting partner who handles all of this and really then um, sets them up for the top three to five candidates. Um, when you're choosing a recruiting partner, you, know, you want to look at, like I said, that specialization versus do you need them specialized in that role? Do you need the recruiter to know that type of role? Or do you want the recruiter to know you and then be able to find the skills and experience in addition to the people that fit who you are? Somebody who can really talk about who you are and where you're headed. Um, the, the cool thing about someone who has some organizational understanding is their PR for you as well. So they're out in the marketplace, even if it's not someone you're going to hire, talking about where you're going and who you are, which is always good. Um, you want to look for someone who acts as a partner and has transparency. They're not hiding details of the person. They're not hiding details to the candidates about you. They've got some um, open doors to their uh, KPIs and tracking on your behalf. You want someone who's great at communicating and responsive. You want someone who's aligned with your values and how you want to be represented in the marketplace. And then always look at fee structure and scope of work. Um, and then there's some information about what the talent store offers. And then, of course, here at UACI, just me personally, um, help you guys kind of uh, get closest to this as you can with where you're at so far.